Good day, all. Things are going smoothly. Um, brief reminder, we will have lab this Thursday. We'll meet on campus for two heat and thermo labs. Um, for today, we'll continue with... Um, well, yesterday, we started Chapter 15, Electricity... Um, and we got up to looking at the formula for Coulomb's Law. Today we're going to start using that formula and show some different types of examples where it will come up and be useful. Excuse me. Um, let me know if, there's, if you have any needs or issues before we get started with that. Just a second. Okay. So, we talked about electric charge, and this is the formula that kind of explains what, why, at least explains the math behind why electric charges do the things that they're most known for. Namely, um, attracting the opposite charge and repelling the same charge. So, uh, charged particles will exert a force on each other based on, according to this formula, the magnitudes of their charge. The more charged they are, the bigger the force will be, and that's why neutrally charged objects don't exert electric force on each other. Uh, it also depends on the distance between the two objects squared. So specifically, uh, the force is inversely proportional to that square. So the farther apart two things are, the weaker the electric force between them. Uh, not exactly the same, but very similar to how if you bring two magnets closer together, the force between them will get stronger until eventually they're strong enough to stick to each other. The further apart they are, the weaker it is. So, those are the factors that can affect the force between two charged objects. Let's utilize that knowledge in our first uh, practical example of this. Let's say we have two electrons, and so this is a relatively common way to represent an electron, just a small circle with a minus sign on it. Uh, I tend to try to color cord negatives as blue and positives as red. So we have two electrons that are one millimeter apart. Now, these two objects have charge. They're going to exert some amount of force on each other. And colloquially, um, if you're familiar with the idea that opposite charges attract and like charges repel, we should know going into this that since these are both negatives, they are going to repel and push each other farther apart. So before even doing any math, we know that the force should put point outwards on both objects. So that's, that's useful. That helps us set up the physical situation. That helps us understand what's going to physically happen here. We've been asked to find the magnitude of the electric force between these two particles and the resulting acceleration of each electron due to that electric force. So, let's get started. We're going to consult our new formula. It is called Coulomb's Law. So when I say Coulomb's Law, I'm referring to this electric force equation. Force equals KQQ divided by R squared. So to use this properly right now, uh, we're solving for force. We need to plug in the value for K. That is always a constant. That's always 8.99 times 10 to the ninth universal electrical constant. Uh, that's on, It's in these notes. It's on the formula sheet. Next, we need to plug in the magnitudes of our two charges. So, char uh, what we have here is two electrons. So, they will have the same charge. And we need to consult with this little table from yesterday what the charge of an electron is. Every electron will have the same charge as long as it's just a single electron. 
So they will both have a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. So very small number. Each single electron doesn't carry that much charge on it. What this means is, since one electron's charge is so teeny tiny, the unit of one whole coulomb, you will never experience one entire coulomb of charge in your life because one entire coulomb is trillions of displaced electrons separated from their protons uh, that would create electric forces so huge that it would immediately create lightning and try to rectify itself. So you'll never experience one whole Coulomb, realistically speaking. Most of the Coulomb measurements for this chapter are going to be very small, you know, up to factors of times 10 to the negative 19th like this one is. Uh, but this is the number that we'll plug in for our two charges. And since both charges have the same charge, they're both electrons, the same number we will use for both. It's important to use the negative here. It's important to carry in the negative here as uh, electrons are negatively charged. So it's listed here as negative 1.6. We need to bring that negative sign into the formula with us. We'll talk about why that's important in a second. So those are our two charges. We will then divide by the radius between the two charges squared. They're one millimeter apart. So if you convert one millimeter to just meters, that's 0 0.001, and then that number will be squared. All of this will combine to give us a force of approximately 2.3 times 10 to the negative 22nd Newtons. That is a tremendously small amount of force. Tremendously small amount of force. You would never notice this amount of force, just this force. Um, yesterday I mentioned... Sorry, puppy's barking at something. No, Penny. Um, this force is so small you'd never notice it. This would be like if one electron was being moved in one hair on your arm and you, you wouldn't notice that twitch. Um, so the forces between individual electrons and protons tend to be very, very, very tiny. That's worth keeping in mind. Now, looking at this number here that we would calculate from this formula, notice that we got a positive answer. We plugged in two separate negative charges. The two charges we plugged in are negative. Those two negatives are going to cancel, and that gave us a positive answer. If, hypothetically, we swap these electrons out for protons, so if both electrons became protons and we did that example instead, the charge of a proton is the same number, but just with a positive sign on it. So, if we plugged in two protons instead of two electrons, we would get the same answer. Because we'd be plugging in two positive numbers, and that would give us a positive answer. Whereas, previous here with our two electrons, we plugged in two negative numbers, but still got a positive answer. This tells us, since we know that like charges repel, this tells us that if you get a positive answer out of Coulomb's law, then the force is going to repel the two objects. Whatever the number is, if you get a positive answer out of Coulomb's law, it'll be a repelling force. Meanwhile, uh, say instead of two electrons or two protons, we plugged in one electron and one proton. So opposite charges. If you do that, you'd plug in one positive number and one negative number. There's only one negative, so it doesn't get canceled out by a second negative. In that case, if it was one proton and one electron, we'd get a negative answer. So opposite charges is the only way to get a negative number out of this particular formula. So what that means is if you get a negative answer from this Coulomb's Law equation, 
then that force is attracting the two objects. It's pulling them closer together. Positive answer is repelling. Negative answer is attracting. That's a, a decent footnote to keep in the corner of your notes. So asterisk next to the formula, positive is repel, negative is attract. There's something along that train of thought. Something else that I would like to make clear is that whatever number you calculate from this formula, the force acts equally on both objects. What that means is, in the case of the, the original question, the question as written, as presented here, where two electrons are one, meter, one millimeter apart, the first electron is pushing the second electron away with this much force. Electron A pushes on electron B with 2.3 times 10 to the negative 12, sorry, negative 22nd Newtons. The second electron also pushes away back on the first electron with the same amount of force. This is not, just to keep in your mind, this is not as if there's some total amount of force being divided between the two. Each one exerts that number on each other. They are both subject to this force from the other one. They are both under 2.3 times 10 to the negative 22nd newtons. It's just a question of what direction it points in. They're both being repelled, but for one of them... They are, be they are both being repelled. That is still true. Uh, but since they're... It just means that one of them will move to the left and one of them will move to the right. But, okay. Um, I feel like I'm stumbling over my words a little bit. <clears throat> the force acts equally on both. You don't divide it up. It acts equally on both. Uh, this is due to Newton's third law. If you'll remember... Um, Action force creates equal and opposite reaction force. So if one pushes on the second, the second pushes back on the first. So they are both subject to this amount of force, and it will specifically push them outwards. Now the second thing that we were asked, what is the resulting acceleration of each electron? That's... This is going to require us to go back to basics a little bit. Um, we know the force acting on each electron... And this table can tell us the mass of each electron. Force acting on mass causes acceleration. So we can use good old-fashioned F equals MA to determine what the acceleration of these electrons will be just as they're sitting next to each other. So we'll take the force we just calculated, 2.3 times 10 to the negative 19... 2.3 times 10 to the negative 22nd, excuse me, That'll be equal to the mass of the electron, which our chart here says is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st. That's the smallest known thing with mass presently. Uh, so that very small number times our resulting acceleration, the variable that we're trying to find. So to find A, we'd want to divide the mass over to the other side, and that will give us... We're, we're dividing us we're going to end up dividing a very small number you know on the factor of 10 to the negative 22nd by an even smaller number something on the factor of 10 to the negative 31st so and when you divide by a small number like smaller than one you tend to get a bigger answer so our resulting acceleration is 252 million six hundred and twenty seven thousand eight hundred and eighty one point four meters per second squared that is the resulting acceleration of these two electrons just sitting next to each other even though the actual numerical force is very tiny the mass of these particles is so small that it still creates incredible speeds and incredible accelerations regardless of the force being tiny. And that's why electrons tend to not want anything to do with each other. Two electrons sitting alone in the vacuum 
will blast apart extremely fast. The only reason that they don't do this on a day-to-day basis, because your body's full of electrons, and so, hypothetically, they could all be rocketing apart at this speed right now. They could all eject out of your body, and there could be lightning everywhere, because there's electrons moving everywhere trying to escape from one another. The reason this doesn't happen is because, one, there's also protons everywhere, those protons are attracting the electrons as strongly as other electrons repel electrons. And two, since there is electrons everywhere, like, we don't really usually have an isolated case where two electrons are alone with just each other. In your own body, each of these electrons is surrounded on all sides by millions more in every single direction. And so all of those other electrons are exerting forces on these two, and all the forces generally end up canceling out. If they didn't, the electrons would shoot apart and things would be pretty chaotic. But because the entire universe is full of electrons and protons, and since everything ends up kind of neutrally charged for that reason, the net electric force on most individual objects and particles in the known universe tends to be zero because things tend to end up neutrally charged so objects as a whole don't have any electric force acting on them and two each individual subatomic particle is surrounded on all sides by you know trillions of other particles with charge and all the forces most of the time end up adding up to zero unless you induce some charge difference to then create motion. So, this stuff happens all around us, but most of the time, it all evens out. Most of the time, you don't get big accelerations like this just because of all the other nearby electrons kind of stopping the whole thing. But, that's how you use the formula, and... That's why this formula doesn't make every single electron move apart from each other at rapid speed. Uh, One thing to note, again, the radius term is on the bottom of the formula. So the closer together two things are, the more force there will be between them. The further apart they are, the much, much weaker it would get. So just a matter of scale. Uh, Additionally, the last time I did this example in class, someone noticed uh, that my picture here kind of resembled the eyes and mouth of a frog. And I just liked the artwork, so I put it in my notes. Okay, let's look at a few more examples, a few more cases where this formula could be used, because... There's lots of different applications, lots of different types of samples that might be on your homework. Uh, First, let's say instead of two particles adjacent to each other, we instead have three. We have two positively charged particles and one negatively charged particle. They're all equidistant from each other, so they're currently forming a equilateral triangle. Uh, We know all of their charges, And the first thing we're being asked is, what is the force on the charge at the origin? So we're going to focus primarily on this charge right here at the origin of our little XY plane graph right here. So we want to know how much force is being exerted on the two microcoulomb charge. If you haven't used this symbol in a while, this is the metric prefix for micro. Micro is times 10 to the negative sixth, whereas milli is times 10 to the negative three. So we want to find the force that acts on the two microcoulomb charge from the negative four microcoulomb charge and the seven microcoulomb charge. Now, before doing any work on this question, I want to briefly think about what direction you think the net force on this particular object is going to point. The 
The object we are looking at, the one at the origin that we want to find the net force on, is positively charged. And it's going to have forces acting on it in two different directions, one from this negative charge and one from this more strong positive charge. So, before any math, before any application, I just want you to think for a second, what direction do you think the net force here is going to point? What If these particles were put in this situation and then allowed to move freely, what direction do you think the two microcoulomb charge would get pushed in as a result of these two other particles pushing on it? Uh, the negative charge is going to try to pull this two microcoulomb charge towards it. So the negative will try to pull our, our home charge, the charge we care about, to the right. But the second positive charge is stronger than the negative charge. It's going to try to push the proton. I guess it's not really a proton. It's going to try to push the positive away from itself so in the in kind of a southeast direction it's going to take the proton and push it this way so the two forces that we have adding up here one of them points to the right on the x-axis one of them points southeast and those are the two forces that are going to need to add up to become the net force so we need to calculate separately those two forces and then add them together. Step one is just finding what the magnitudes of those forces will be. So I've got two separate calculations here. We're going to use Coulomb's law twice. Uh, first, I looked at the positive and the negative. So using Coulomb's law, we want to find the force between the positive and the negative. So uh, F equals KQQ over R squared. Our first force will equal our K constant, 8.99 times 10 to the 9th, times our first charge, uh, that's the two microcoulombs, and then times our second charge, that's our, it's going to be our negative four microcoulombs. And then we divide by the distance between them squared. All of our particles in this example are going to be 0.5 meters apart. It's going to give us a net force of 0.288 newtons and specifically the negative is going to pull our home origin charge to the right. The positive and the negative are going to attract and from the positive charge's perspective that's going to pull it to the right. So that's what I've indicated right here with this arrow we would get a negative answer doing this math. And the negative is what tells us it's going to be an attracting force. I have taken that, that negative and that assumption and written instead this right-facing arrow to represent that. So from our origin charge's perspective, force one coming from the negative charge is going to pull it with this amount of force to the right. So that's force one. The second force, force two, is going to come from the other positive charge. So we'll use the same formula. The only difference here is that we're going to plug in the positive seven uh, microcoulombs instead of negative four. That's going to give us a positive answer, which tells us repulsion. The two positive charges are going to repel one another. And we get a number of 0.503 newtons, pointing again um, away from our origin particle's perspective. This force is going to push away from the current location of the second positive. So that's going to be down and to the left, um, 60 degrees beneath the negative x-axis. There's a few different ways you could write that. And notice, since the 7 is bigger in magnitude than the negative 4, 
this force is a bigger number. It's This charge is about twice as big, and as a result, it's exerting about twice as much force. We now need to add these two forces together to find the net force acting on the origin charge. And notice that since the forces are not pushing in the same axis, we can't just literally add them together. We're going to have to employ some good old-fashioned trigonometry. I show all my trig on this next slide. Uh, this image here, which... Yeah, let's see if I can zoom in on that, actually. Whoops. Ah, yes, I can. Or I thought I could. Okay. I'm going to zoom in on the triangle that I've drawn. So, the two forces that are going to be acting on our particular charge here, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, I lost my train of thought. It happens to me frustratingly often. I apologize. <coughs> Okay, we need to add our two forces together. We have our first force, the point 288 in the, x, in the positive x-axis, uh, that we need to add to our second force. Now our second force points at a weird angle. It's not in the x-axis. So before we can actually do this step, we need to break that force down into its x-y components so that we can add like with like and get our proper sum, sum answer. To do that, we need to take our force 2, since it points at a weird angle, and break it down into its components. So this is our 0.503 newtons. This is the force from the positive 7 microcoulomb charge. <coughs> Excuse me. That's going to point opposite that object. Uh, and as a result, the way that I've drawn this picture, that puts it at uh, 30 degrees beneath the uh, negative x-axis. And so I've drawn this little triangle here to help us split the 0.503 newtons into its corresponding x and y components. Uh, to do that... Um, since we know this hypotenuse, and since we know the angle, and there's more than one way you could draw this triangle if you wanted to, uh, we can use our sine and cosine functions. Uh, sine of 30 degrees would tell us the opposite leg, the y leg, over the hypotenuse, whereas the cosine leg, uh, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, would tell us the x leg. So this is my work for finding the two component legs of the force from the positive 7 microcoulomb charge. So this is breaking it down into its xy components. Once you've broken it down like that, you can then add it with our first force. Our first force is in, I've written it here in terms of xy form. This is its x-coordinate, and since it's entirely in the x-axis, its y-coordinate is just zero. 
we can then add our two component legs to this force. Notice that uh, based on the coordinate system, the force, the outward force from the seven microcoulomb charge points in both the negative x-axis and the negative y-axis. So I've plugged in two negative numbers here for that reason to represent those directions. Oops, pardon me. So, our positive x-force will add with our negative x-force to create a slightly smaller negative x-force. Meanwhile, we're adding zero to the y component of our first force, so that ultimately won't change the value at all. And that means that the our, our final total summation force, the total force that is acting on this origin charge particle, the two microcoulomb particle, is equal to uh, 0.152 newtons in the negative x direction and uh, 0.25 newtons in the negative y direction, which tells us that this particle is still going to be pushed to the left and down. I asked you before looking at the math for this what direction you thought the particle would get pushed in. Uh, the positive particle is going to try to push it down this way. The negative particle is going to try to push, pull it to the right. But the positive charge is the stronger of the two. So it's naturally going to exert more force. As a result, the force from the positive charge here since it's the bigger one, tends to be more in control of the direction that our origin to microcoulomb charge is going to move in. So even though the negative is here exerting force, the positive charge, since it's just stronger, is going to kind of overpower it and it's still going to end up pushing the particle away from itself, more so than the negative is able to pull the origin charge towards itself. So that's what the two negatives here mean. Once we have the two negatives, uh, we can consult the Pythagorean theorem to get one complete total answer. So we're going to end up pushing 0.15 in the negative x and 0.25 in the negative y. And so that will give us a, if we consult the Pythagorean theorem, a total, like our single final answer for the net force, the magnitude of the total force acting on this particular charged particle will be 0.293 newtons. And it'll still specifically be pointing south. I wrote west when I should have written... No, yeah, that's right. South, west. It's still going to be pointing in that third quadrant, sort of down and to the left, but mostly down. So, the forces from charged particles point in every single possible direction all at the same time. And as a result, since they can end up pointing in odd hybrid directions, occasionally some trig will be required. Pardon me, sorry. Let me actually, what I'd like to do is load up chapter five, 15 homework to show some sample questions that'll be related to this. Okay. 
All right. So, I'm presently sharing the chapter 15 homework. Uh, the very first question on the assignment is very similar to the one we just did. Three charges are arranged in a pattern shown below. Find the magnitude and direction of the electrostatic force on the charge on the origin. So, uh, this, pro this first question on the homework is very, very similar. It will work exactly the same way to the question we just looked at. So, when you begin the homework, when you're looking at that question, that's the example to consult in your notes. Um, looking at some further examples, we're about to look at one that's similar to two. We'll at least start it today. Uh, number three is pretty similar, but everything here is in a single axis, so that simplifies it a little bit. Uh, number three, uh, sorry, number five is also very similar to number one and to the homework, this, sorry, the sample question that we just did. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is a few of the places where this information is applied. There's one more um, sample question, uh, one more uh, application that I'd like to show you because uh, there's another homework question that involves it. Hmm. Excuse me. So, uh, what we have here is another two objects that are going to be exerting electrical forces on one another. Uh, here we have two uh, objects, two balls that are hanging. Now these spheres are electrically charged. They have some amount of charge on them, but we don't know what that charge is yet. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that they are equally charged. Whatever their charge is, it's going to be the same magnitude and the same sign for the sake of simplicity. So they are both currently charged with some unknown charge Q. We don't know what it is. It's what we're going to be ultimately solving for. Now, these two objects are hanging straight down from ropes. They're tied to the ceiling or tied to an apparatus, and under normal circumstances, gravity would have them just hang straight down. But a lot kind of like, again, uh, your hair when you're touching a Van de Graaff generator or when you're in one of those plastic slides. Uh, if these two objects are electrically charged, if they're both positive or both negative, they will start to repel from one another. So gravity is still pulling them down, but there is an electric force, some amount of electric force that is additionally pushing them apart at the same time. So as a result, instead of hanging straight down, they're hanging at these odd angles. Uh, we do know the magnitude of that angle. We know how long the string is, we know how far apart the two strings are mounted, and we know the mass of each object. Our question here, our challenge, is to determine what charge must they have in order to be making this possible. So for this, we're going to be using Coulomb's Law. The main thing that I want to demonstrate is how trigonometry sort of plays into this one. To start with, I just want to examine the forces presently acting on one of these two objects. So we're going to focus on the left one first. If you look at this left object, what I've drawn here are arrows representing every single force that would presently be acting on this particular object. It's currently suspended from a rope, and that rope is going to exert tension. That rope is going to pull inwards and cause force cause tension on that particular object. So that's one of the forces present. So I've drawn an arrow representing that tension. Additionally, assuming this takes place on planet Earth, 
there would be a force of gravity pulling straight down. And we know that since these objects are charged and since they're repelling away from each other, there needs to be some electric force, the Coulomb's law force, uh, pushing, at least from the perspective of this, of this one of the two objects, towards the left. So the right object is pushing leftwards on the left object. So from, from this drawing, if we're focusing on the left of the two, it's being pushed this way. Those are the three forces presently acting on this particular object. And if the ball is simply hanging there, if it's suspended on its rope, if it's not moving, if something isn't accelerating, according to Newton's laws, that tells us that the net force acting on that particular object must be zero. That tells us that all three of these forces present must add up to zero. They all point in different directions, but they have to add up to zero or else the object wouldn't just be hanging in place. And the same is going to be true of the right object as well. It has the same forces acting on it, just mirrored 180 degrees. So the two, the two balls are under the same list of forces, and on both objects, they must all add up to zero. We're going to use that to our advantage, because in order to calculate their charge, we do need to utilize Coulomb's law. But since we don't know their charge, we don't really know what the force on them is. And so in order to use Coulomb's law, we need to f use some other way of determining what the electric force is so that we can plug the electric force into Coulomb's law and solve for charge instead of the other way around. I'll quickly tab back to the formula itself to try to show what I mean. So this is our Coulomb's Law formula. In this question, we've been asked to find the charge of the two objects. In order to solve for Q, we need to know how far apart they are, and we need to know the electric force between them. That means in order to use this formula to successfully solve for Q, we have to approximate both R and F using other means. And we're going to use trigonometry to be able to do that. Uh, first, I'm going to show you how we're going to approximate the force, because that's, I'd say, the bigger hurdle of the two. Uh, since all these forces, the tension, the gravity, and the electric force, must add up to zero, uh, I am able to draw to redraw them all together in this shape as a right triangle. Uh, I know that the electric force is in the x-axis, the gravitational force is in the y-axis, and the tension is at some angle between them. These three different legs, these three different forces, can form the legs of a right triangle. Gravity points down, electric force points left, tension points up and to the right. These forces all add up to zero. They all perfectly form the legs of a triangle to balance each other out. They need to balance out for this to work. And once we draw this triangle... We don't know the tension, but we do know the angle between the rope and the vertical, which means we know the angle between tension and the vertical force of gravity. And since we know the mass of the ball, we can approximate the force of gravity acting on the ball. So we have an idea of the weight, we know the angle, and as long as you know the angle and one of the legs of a right triangle, you can use trig to find all of the other legs. Which means we can use trig to help us approximate what the electric force needs to be in this scenario. So, uh, in order to do that, we only know one of these angles. 
So from this angle's perspective, the electric force is the opposite leg and gravity is the adjacent leg. That means we're gonna to need to use tangent. Tangent of 10 degrees will equal the opposite, the electric force, divided by the adjacent, which is gravity. And so that's what I have written here. So tangent of 10 degrees equals electric force divided by gravity. We can use this to find the magnitude of the electric force. Once we have that force, we can plug it into Coulomb's law and that'll help us solve for Q. The other thing that we need to approximate is how far apart the two spheres are. We know how far apart they normally are. The two strings are rooted 10 cent, sorry. The two strings are rooted three centimeters apart. So if they weren't electrically charged, if they were just hanging straight down, they'd still be three centimeters apart, but they are charged and therefore they've pushed slightly away from one another. So they're not three centimeters apart anymore. It's a little further than that now. So we're gonna to need to use a little bit more trig to help us figure out exactly how, afar, how far apart they've grown. So I've redrawn the same right triangle as before, but instead of making it a force triangle, I've made it a distance triangle. Uh, Cause we know from the drawing, the rope is five centimeters long and it currently sits 10 degrees away from the vertical. That is enough information to give us another right triangle. And of, on this triangle that I've drawn, the distance between the vertical and the ball's current position is the horizontal leg of the triangle. We can use this triangle to figure out how far away from its normal position the sphere has been pushed. So in order to do that, since we know the 10 degrees, we want the X leg, and now we know the hypotenuse, we would need to employ sine of 10 degrees equals opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of 10 equals our new X leg divided by five. That tells us that this ball has been pushed 0.87 centimeters to the left of where it would normally be. That means that the ball on the right has also been pushed 0.87 centimeters away from where it would normally be. And that's going to make the total distance between the two spheres 3 centimeters plus 0.87 plus another 0.87. Because both spheres have been pushed 0.87 away from their starting positions. So 3 plus 0.87 plus 0.87 gives us a grand total of the two spheres being 4.74 centimeters apart. So that's the total distance between the two. And that is what we can now plug in for R. So we can use trig to compare the forces we know to find the electric force we can use trig to help us figure out what R is. Once we've done that, the only unknown left is Q, and we can solve for that Q. Now in my formula here, uh, I've got tangent of 10 degrees equals the electric force over the force of gravity. So for electric force, I've plugged in the Coulomb's law formula and for gravity, I've plugged in mass times 9.8. Our only unknown left is Q, which is good. Uh, in order to find Q, we have to make use of the fact that the two spheres have the same charge. The two spheres have the same charge. That means that it's not two different Qs, it's the same Q twice. Just normal Q times normal Q which means we could simplify that to Q squared and make it a single Q variable. So it's not two separate Qs, it's not two unknowns, it's just one unknown. Plugging in everything we know, solving for Q, our final answer 
would be 8.05 times 10 to the negative eighth coulombs. That is the needed charge. You need to charge the spheres up this much for them to rest this far apart from one another. If they are charged any less than this, then they will rest not quite that far apart. If they're charged more than that, then they'll move even further apart. And that is the prin this principle, Coulomb's Law, applied to two hanging objects. I wanted to show you this one specifically because I'm going to show the homework again. Uh, the homework has a question pretty much identical to this one. We've got two spheres that are hanging from some length of string. We know the angle from the vertical that the strings presently are. <coughs> so when working on the homework, number two here works exactly the same way as the two hanging spheres from the notes. I believe that'll actually be most of the information needed for this particular homework. So, that's Coulomb's Law and several different examples that involve it in some way, shape, or form. Any issues, comments, concerns, needs, questions, etc., please let me know. Um, We'll have our usual break here. Um, go have a snack, take a break. Uh, look over the homework again. As soon as you open the questions and look at them, it'll help you be able to come back to them later. I'll be here for the next hour or so if you have any questions. So pop back in if you do. Um, additional small announcements. I'm going to try to get your tests graded and back to you today so you'll know how you did. Uh, lab on Thursday. Tomorrow, we'll focus primarily on making sure that all this math from Coulomb's Law works for you. So look over the homework, make sure that if you have any questions, you either ask them today or bring them to lecture tomorrow. And we'll probably try to wrap up chapter 15, actually, so that um, we'll wrap up, yeah, we'll make sure everyone's good with Coulomb's Law, wrap up chapter 15 tomorrow, We'll have lab on Thursday, and then we'll spend Friday probably doing a free homework day. So let me know how that sounds. Let me know if you have any issues, needs, complaints, etc. And if you don't have any questions now, hop back in later. And if you don't, I will see you tomorrow.